size matters not. Look at me. Judge me by my size, do you? Hmm? Hmm. And where you should not. For my ally is the Force. And a powerful ally it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings, though we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you. Here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. Welcome, Girl Skis, to the Frugal Force. This is episode eight, and tonight we're going to be uh, covering quite a few topics. But just before we went live, we were talking about uh, different, like uh, unorthodox, like sweeteners, like basically uh, you're using fruit juices and fruits and whatnot to throw in towards the end of flour. And I do have some personal experience with this, but I stopped doing it for two things because the organic guru guy, I was. Uh, apprenticing under he's basically told me i was dumb the plants can't suck that up and uh two it caused fungus net outbreaks like no other but i i like you like you were saying uh was it duke diamond uses uh what was it strawberries or pineapples or something like that yeah uh, i don't know he just said he uses fruit juice and I've heard other guys talk about that too, where like they, it's if you can drink it, it should be you know safe for your soil kind of thing. But I, I don't know how you know citric acid plays into that or whatever either. But yeah, yeah, I don't know citric ever. <laughs> I think it's mostly. I think that I really still believe it's the sugar that's doing the most change in the soil. That's gonna you know increase your microbes. But I don't know. I've heard also. Uh, was it uh, Eagle Garden said that he waters his bubble ha bubble hash water, throwaway water? He doesn't throw it away. He waters it into his plants. Which, now, there might be some secondary metabolites in, in that water um, from the actual wash. You know what I mean? Whatever is soluble in water. Maybe there's a turbine or something that's soluble in water or something. So there, that's that would be more intriguing to me than, than another plant. You see what I mean? For, something from the same plant that that's more intriguing to me because you know that the plant that you're watering into might actually know what to do with that whatever it is <laughs> in the that's water something i've always wanted to know science on because i know personally because i've always made bubble hash and then before i started making the kool-aid i would always feed it back to the plants and those harvests or those plants that got the hash water they would always be praying the next day and if i remember right the harvest road is really good so I know there's some kind of beneficial effect to it. It's not just giving them water. There's, there's something else in there because they pray afterwards in my experience. Please rise. Now sit on it. The fawns be with you. And also with you. Let us A. A. That's what makes that water green. So like Dragonfly Earth Medicine talks about this. I think even on, on like Hash Church and whatever, but they talk about it a lot where they rewater their, their hash water back to it. And if you think about it in uh, one of the Jadam or whatever, but they steep, they'll take a bunch of weeds and they'll steep it in water. And that's basically what you're doing with the cannabis. So, you know, that same chlorophyll. Chlorophyll? More like borophyll. And all the other stuff that makes that water green is basically like a fertilizer to the plant. So they should be praying and it should be giving them exactly what they want, you know. That's what I think. I mean, it'd be easier for the plant to digest what it's made out of than something completely different. And I mean, that's all that hash water is, is, you know, everything that makes our plant fragrant. So if it can take it up, that'd be the best way. Really what you have to think about is when we're adding, you have to remember when we're adding things to our soils in an organic setting, we can't be thinking about, oh, is the plant going to take this up? And is this going to help the plant to make whatever better? What we really need to be thinking is, is this going to help the microbe population? Is this going to do 
what we need in the soil to give me the best results in the plant because I mean, I don't have the answers. I'm just guessing here, but I'm guessing whatever, whatever that effect is that we're getting from this hash water, I bet you, or I'd be willing to bet that it's making an effect on the microbes more than it is the plant itself. The plant is kind of like a secondary, the plant getting its nutrients that it's looking for is like the secondary benefit, really the initial benefit. I think it's hitting those microbes, but Again, <laughs> I don't have any evidence for it other than just what I know about my goats. <laughs> no, I like that. It ties it back to feeding the soil, and that's the truth behind it. And it's easy to think like that, too, where, oh, I add something to it, and it's going to take it up, and it's not necessarily like that. You're dead right. I've heard of guys adding lavender and having that terpene kind of pop up in a, in a profile on a bud that they've harvested. Now, do you mean they're adding lavender to the bed as far as a lavender plant that's growing along with it or are you talking about they somehow like essential oil or something they added to the plant these or, are outdoor guys yeah they're growing a companion plant chop and drop and then okay i was gonna say i've heard the same thing with a companion plant it wasn't so much like a watered in thing but it was because it was in a field of whatever and they claimed that it took on another property because that i i 100 believe and i don't again i'm gonna <laughs> I want to sound like a broken record with this stuff, but again, I don't think it's so much the the plants directly affecting each other because the plants are stuck in the ground and they're not moving, but it's that network of the ground of maybe fungal hyphae passing, you know, resources along, or maybe it's, you know, a bacteria that's, maybe it's a rhizophagy bacteria that's running around and, and going getting some, you know, obscure thing that is an exudate maybe from a lavender plant, we'll say. And uh, it's pulling that as a nutrient, a micronutrient, and it's bringing it back to the, uh, the root system of the, the cannabis plant. And then the cannabis plant's blowing itself all off to take those nutrients. And then it fucking shoots out the plant and fucking makes it form more roots. And then the whole system goes all over again. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I, I might be thinking, it might have just been an old story from back in the day, but isn't that how DJ Short got his blueberry? It's just growing a, a land race in a, a field of blueberries for so long, and then it, just the cross-pollination gave it that taste eventually? I don't know. I haven't heard the story of his blueberry. I don't know. I think it was strawberry cough. That's what I was going to say. That Like, all these old stories are so, you know, you hear some so many differences but like strawberry cough the one i heard it came from a strawberry farm you know what i mean and that would make sense like it's growing companionly with all these strawberries and like terpenes are an expression of that plant in some form trying to protect itself it's not making it for anything else but for its own function and maybe that's some kind of a signaling to the plant and it's going hey i'm going to pass that same message along and so it starts to produce that a little bit but you know you never know or by or there's some colony of biology that stimulates that terpene expression in the plant because it's in the root zone so having them companions brought that biology to the root zone and that also translated into the cannabis because like chamomile too is one i've heard that is supposedly like increases thc content oil and resin production type stuff I mean, some of that shit's like blows your mind, you know? Yeah. And when you're thinking about like a bed setting or an outdoor setting, then you start adding years and years and years on this story that we're talking about. And you just think like, for example, say, say for example, you had maybe some, a daikon radish growing in the area. Well, that's going to grow really super deep roots and it's going to mine mineral from the freaking bedrock and it's going to eventually die, decompose create a, an open crater which water will go down and fill up and microbe action will start working on it and now all those minerals that the plants that would never get a root system to to access those minerals you know can now access minerals that never would have had a chance to get to magic so um yeah when you when you add these things you start putting time on it you know in like a no-till setting or something like that where you're reusing soil and it really gets fun <laughs> and and I'm pretty sure, like guys, don't go out there and just uh, do the think you're gonna do this in one year. I'm pretty sure this took like a decade or more for him to actually get the flavor in there of just crossing and then keep running the strain out there. But I mean, if that is a factor, I mean, 
I would hope that like my my strain doesn't pick up a daikon radish taste or anything. But like if I was to plant it with blueberries or strawberries, like I would love to think that if I had that as a cover crop and I was constantly composting that into my topsoil, that eventually my strains would pick up that kind of hint. But I, I don't know if it works like that. Like I said, like you said before, I think they just take the sugar out of it at the end of the day. I be. Well, I don't, I don't know. As far as I, I don't know enough about science or the science of taste and, and how that works, like because we're comparing a food with a smoke. I mean, I'm I'm sure the taste is the the is the same as far as how our body perceives it, as far as how, how it the taste smoke is compared to taste anything. But I wonder if if the taste is more of like a, a chemical signal, you know, like maybe it's just so maybe they could be two separate chemicals, but they, as far as what's going into our, and, and, and hitting our taste buds, but the, as far as our body's concerned, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? It gives us the same output, I guess if we should say. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how that mechanism works as far as how the taste works. I never really looked into it, but. <laughs> Not really. Maybe. It's classified. We looked into it, but uh, I was kind of thinking also is that Usually, like, smells are really attached to taste because I, I've heard, I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, but I've always heard that people that um, have lost their sense of smell can't taste anything. Or, like, if you're ready to eat something that's terrible, you don't like, if you pinch your nose, it won't taste so bad. And I've done that, and that's true for me. I don't know if it's a placebo effect. But if I think smell and taste are, are, are combined in our head. So... Um, what I was just thinking when you're talking about, uh, like say cannabis in a field of strawberries, for example, I wonder if the, um, because smells as far as plants, like the smells that the plants are giving off, what those are, are usually a, a terpene that it's, it's admitting for a reason. And it's usually pest control, um, something like that. So I wonder if the cannabis plant has a way to learn from plants around it you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I've never thought of that combination of terpenes for a pest control, but look at all these plants. They're all doing it. Why am I, why yeah. am I not doing this? <laughs> what makes you think she's a witch? Well, she turned me into a newt. A newt. I got better. <laughs> you know, I'm humanizing the plant, but uh, it's just, it's just. No, high we, we talk about the communication that's of the plants all the time, you know, when they plug in. Like, that makes total sense. Like, the hell has this guy got that we don't or like why wouldn't the plant think like that yeah and i was just thinking in my situation in a situation like where as a human if you were in a room of 50 things and they're all doing the same fucking thing and you're not doing it you might be compelled to do that thing yeah. <laughs> well and it's just like how a plant will express differently under different lights too though it's that you know maybe that environment does induce that kind of expression to it or the plant like you say it realizes hey everybody else is doing it i'm gonna blend in but that might be its expression to that environment is kind of the point there but it's cool shit to mess with i don't know yeah yeah that's probably that's my grow off pots now <laughs> <laughs> Just strawberries, man. <laughs> just, just, buy, just go buy some really small strawberry starts and then go to the store and buy a, a pint of strawberries <laughs> and put those big ass strawberries on that small little plant and be like, damn, look how good this is going. <laughs> and you're not going to have no room left for your plant. You're going to have crystals and strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be awesome. How's everybody's plants doing? Everybody here is growing right now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I got, I'm down to three, man. I, two didn't pop. I got to looking at one and it was the scariest thing fucking ever, dude. I I was looking at it really close, of course. I'm like, what What the fuck's going on with this thing? I had it in a root riot. So I was sitting, I, I kind of squeezed it a little bit so it came up higher and I could look at it and a, a white translucent worm came out of that fucking seed. Really? Right. What a worm-like thing. It was like really like, almost see-through and it was it was, there, was, there was a little crack in the seed and i was like okay maybe it was starting to open i was really looking intently at it and this little fucking worm came out and i mean it was tiny but mm -hmm. it, 
that thing went in the garbage so fast, dude. I was like, I don't know what the fuck that is, but it's getting the fuck out of here right now. This is Sparta! I bet you it was an ant larvae. It sounds like it. They'd be the, like, they like to get in there and nibble on the ends of the, the root tips and stuff like that. There was no, well, maybe they'd already eaten the fucking root because there's no root, There's but there was a crack and it came out of there. So yeah, maybe it crawled all the way inside. And, That'd have been cool as fuck if you had that on recording. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought. The first thing I thought. I was like, God damn, I'm addicted to the internet, man. Because the first thing I thought was, man, if I could just record this, this would be fucking awesome. This would be I can just embed it. I would have imagine you jumping too, back when you seen that. Like fucking, uh, was it Ridley and uh, Aliens once you finally uh, popped the egg in the face? I'd go, oh shit. What is this? A center for ants? Dude, it was fucking gross, man. But I, it was weird because it was gross, but it was fascinating at the same time. So I couldn't look away. I was just like, whoa, what the fuck? And, but I was just looking at it. It's like, then I realized that I was thinking, man, this should make a great video. And I knew that wasn't going to happen before the thing was gone or in the grove somewhere. And then uh, the next thought was in the garbage, in a bag, <laughs> get it the fuck out. So, yeah. So I had two that didn't pop. The second one, I just threw that away too, because I wasn't even going to look at that one after that yeah. first one. And the other four had popped and were fine. And one of them has just struggled. And I don't have time for shit that struggles in my garden. So I just fucking cut it. Because I'm not going to have a struggling plant count against my plant count. I, I'd rather have a full plant count of healthy plants. So I got three of them going. And uh, plus I got those seeds from my buddy who just came back from Jamaica from his honeymoon. And I think I'm just going to replace those three with three Jamaica. I'm calling that strange Jamaican honeymoon. <laughs> and uh, whatever the seeds he got there that out of a bud that he said was fire. So we'll see what the heck that is. Let's say, did it, did it come from the real cannabis there or did it come from the tourist cannabis? It came from some cannabis that if you looked at, you wouldn't want to smoke. So I think that's the real cannabis. Uh -oh. <laughs> he said it was fire. So I don't know. We'll see. But by the TV, it will never stop. It seeds too from Jamaica. So I was going to tell you, I'll get them to you and figure out what you want out of them or whatever. But it's probably the same fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hoping it's not some fucking sativa that will never stop flowering. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen some of those like guys growing some of them land race ones and it's like they're cool i mean i don't get but yeah they're like 12 14 weeks deep in the thing and they got this like two liter cola on the top plants are huge and it's kind of like well i mean i can see doing it at home or something but i, I don't know it's not really like a production thing you're gonna want to yeah it's just like something to do to say you have and that's it <laughs> <laughs> I tried to stuff one in a four by two and it was hell trying to keep that thing under control. It was just branches and crap everywhere. Ugliest plant I've ever grown. <laughs> Since we're off on a tangent, I just want to tell you abolish that sour melon that was getting completely dominated by everything in the garden. And I thought it was just going to die in the flower room. Yeah. Shut up. Two branches. I've got two branches, the twin towers right now that uh, they're good, nice, good sized nuggets, nugs on them. So uh, I'm going to have some sour melon to smoke here in probably about another month or so. Nice. And that, that abolish has got like pop. They don't have huge nugs. They're just like popcorn, but they're all over the damn place right now. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> it's interesting that it seems to have gone that way recently. Like I, you can see pictures, not even, I'd say a year ago where I was still getting a, uh, massive colas on there even when i topped it a lot and it just seems like for the last year i've gotten uh buttons or grenades or whatever if you will and it's staying shorter which surprised me it's not real super stretchy so not for me anyways it stayed pretty pretty bushy along with every you know everything else is getting a little bit taller than that but uh mm -hmm. hey fine with me i don't want tall in my garden if i can help it so although i did just order a haze from one of my my prize pack also came with a 500 dollars at that seed bank the Shout out to Great Lakes Genetics Seed Bank, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And one of them I picked out was a haze because I was like, ah, I got I haven't grown a haze yet. <laughs> Speaking of haze, I just got a, an amnesia haze cross from uh, Mantis Genetics. I swear they must do uh, research on me before they send some because they always send like a cross of like something that I miss or that I love. And this time it was amnesia haze. And I actually, I finally have something that has a Mac in it too. I finally got a Mac cross to work with. So that's going to be cool. cool. I got uh, sequences Mac is rooted. And uh, the next one, uh, if you want, 
up a ball, so I'll get you a cut. Um, and Smiley, if you want a cut, if we can meet up sometime. But I'll like, I have to let you guys know when I get one first because they're so fucking slow. Yeah, that that's the thing where I'm debating. I like a bunch it. of seeds to pop. Yeah, I just got these ones too. Oh, Mac Thomper, nice. Yeah, that's my first cap ones too. So awesome. Yeah. So I'm hoping this Mac cross is a little bit quicker growing because I just all the stories I hear about it just makes me like it. If I feel like I'll end up throwing it out before I can get it in the flower because I'm just that type of grower. I Have don't want to wait. Like that. Have you smoked Mac one yet? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got it at the dispensary quite a few times. Like right when it first came out, I went back to back to back. And what'd you think? I loved it. It, but it wasn't, it wasn't like the best strain I've smoked all year. But I think it's definitely amazing. It's cool. You take the bud out, you uh, drop it on a table, and it goes stud. <laughs> it's just pure crystal. Dude, it's, I think it's so good. The flavor. I mean, I'm just talking about the flavor. I think it's just so good. So so good. And, and it works so great in what I call salads when you mix with another strain. So good. It just makes it so – I don't know, dude. I, I'm hoping that the stuff that I grow is the same that I've smoked so for, like, I don't know how long now, since July. Um, mm. It's blessed me almost every smoke break. So um, I love the Mac, dude. And so I'll put up with her for now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think it was the DGC was talking about it today. If you if you love it that much, I mean, all you really have to do is just keep topping your uh, your plants out, and you can run it in a multi strain. Just slow your other plants down to keep up with that one. Oh, what I'm doing is I'm just basically putting it off to the side, letting it do its own damn thing. When it's ready, it's ready. I'll throw it in flower. That's kind of what I do anyway. I grow out like I'm moving more and more. I'm picking up more and more habits from work that I'm kind of transferring at home to make my life easier, except for every change that I make is to make my life easier at home. But I found that if I, if I grow my plant, I grow a little bit more plants than what I need in flower. Like say, say I'm trying to fill four plants in flower. I want, you know, eight or 10 to pick from because I can always cut plants out, but I can't like produce more plants. So when you do it that way, it just lets you, you know, you always have plants and veg that it's like, okay, if I have an extra plant and veg, no big deal. You know what I mean? You know, I've got extra plants and veg at all times anyway. I can always just cut a plant down and still be good when I need room. So uh, that's not a big deal for me to have just a plant that takes extra large to veg. It's just kind of annoying. That's kind of one of, that's an advantage of like having a mother room or a consistent uh, veg room that I don't have that kind of makes sense. Like, <laughs> Damn, do I kind of do I should I dedicate a room to that that's bigger space at all times, or am I better off at my current rate, depending on my clone abilities and timing abilities, to just keep plugging stuff into rooms? Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes I'm holding clones in my like my easy swaps, like last time, those roots were like well throughout the, the little wicking tray up there before I got to even throw them in a bed. Yeah, I think the I think the biggest disadvantage of having a separate veg is that you don't get to veg to your space. I mean, you can kind of plan it out, but you don't, you're not actually in that space. So when you move plants from veg to flower, it might not fit exactly perfect how you wanted it. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I like, I mean, I don't miss that so much because like, I mean, I can duplicate a four by four in my veg and, and you know, just make sure the plants go in the same order once they move over to flower. Yeah. The one thing that I always struggle with is like my flower room, I have three lights in there, but it's one flower room. So, and it's a perpetual grow. So they're on different cycles. Each light is on a different cycle. It's a different age. So I can't do things like adjust the environment colder at the end of a cycle because I have another cycle that's in the middle of a cycle. It's not at the end of the cycle. Um, so you don't roll the dice to benefit the one that's about to get chopped down? No, no, you're a better man than me. It's like, dude, I, dude, I, run, I run that same way, and you can't go dark 24 or 48 hours before harvest either because they're all. Always... But I do what I do that is I wheel them out. I wheel them out of the flower room and I put them in a dark room for, you know, usually a day. But I, I, I usually do two days. I try to get two days in. Sometimes I've gone four or five days. I just set them in there until I can get to the damn things. But, um, 
I forgot there was another point I was going to make about that. Oh, but sometimes I really wish I had like a fl a flower chain, you know, four or three separate chambers in my flower room. So I could do things like what you're saying, like turn the lights off or, um, you know, change the environment. But I think you lose when you do that, when you have the separate chambers, you lose on like the extra light I have for side lighting. Like when I have two lights next to each other, that space in between is getting some fucking sweet light that I wouldn't normally get. You know what I mean? So I don't know. There's pros and cons, but uh, I think if I had to do it again, I would still do a veg, a separate veg and a separate flower and do just a whole single flower room because the advantage of like controlling the atmosphere, you only got to have one AC. You only got to have so many fans. You only got to have, you know, you don't have to double, triple things for having, you, you know, you have to have all that stuff for each light or just put them all in one room and you only have to have one of everything. Or, or however many you're using or whatever it is. Yeah. So I don't know. I just, that's what I've done and that's what works for me. But uh, those are just some of the thought processes. I don't, we got way off tangent. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, this is good stuff. I mean, we're, we're all like dealing with the similar systems pretty much. Most of the viewers too. And really I could solve that issue myself. If I started to bring in say like something like nectar or, I started making teas like we wanted to get into here uh, shortly to uh, supplement my plants and feed them because I've grown some monsters in like one gallon uh, pots and stuff like that just using organic methods. But I'm so like minimal, especially in the clone era. Like even, even my grow off stuff, all it's gotten is the water. I just put it in old coca local soil and I let it sit there and wick until I'm ready to put it into a bed. They get nothing until then. Unless I have, I might have an optic foliar sampler sitting around. I'm, I'm not against using that to uh, bring a clone back if it's starting to yellow. But yeah, step up your game a little bit. You can fix things too. <laughs> yeah, but I think a veg, a separate veg, I don't know. I think I try to, I often wonder, like, if I didn't have a separate veg, I would have to have so many separate rooms because you know unless you have all your rooms vegging all at once or i don't know how, how do you do it you have each room on a separate schedule yeah uh, thank god for uh the smart timers and all that that you can just have on your phone now but yeah we have five rooms now working on possibly a sixth and yeah we just we, i have my timers on my app that i flip around and the messed up thing is I even dry in that same room too. So like say the week or so, if I get lucky 10 days of uh, drying, <laughs> uh, I have that room down into the sixties. Like I, I end up sacrificing stuff and everything works out for me in there, but <clears throat> yeah. So I it, wonder if you took what, just one of the rooms that you have now made it a dedicated veg your other rooms would only be in flower all the time and you'd have to, although you'd have to find another place to dry but if you're if your other rooms stayed in flower the entire time you would make up for the lost flower room i think in time well we do have a there is a not there technically is a veg room if but it's not very tall i call it my baby room because it doesn't have it's not very tall it's a four by two or no, it's a two by two tent that I flipped on its side and put on top of a four by two and it fits perfectly snug up against the ceiling. Uh, so if I was to bring in like teas and stuff like that, I think I could uh, supplement them in there and keep topping them and keep them super healthy until they're ready to go into the pots rather than uh, let them go to fishing and stuff like that that I've been doing. You know, Cause I mean, even, once I get the plants plugged in, it's just a matter of like a week or two and then they're back up to normal, no matter how rough they are, it seems like. But See, I, I look, look at it like you got to plant them in sets. So depending on how many you want to throw into flower at a time, whether it's two or it's four, then you want to plan out about three sets behind that. So like you have ones that are veg and ready to go in flower. You have ones that are, you know, teens that are ready to get transplanted into their next bigger pot and you have your little baby clones that are ready to go so that would be kind of yeah going. you're always taking clones but that's the way to plan that out because ultimately your your bottleneck in that production is going to be the two months that you have at 
eight to nine weeks at least of flower time where you're going to have that whole room tied up. So like what I ran into or used to run into before I started planting better, but I still do anyway, but you, you get these big trees that are like, you know, like they should have been in flower like four yeah. weeks ago. And you're like, well, fuck, these other ones are still finishing and you don't want to, so you're just hacking them back and you're like doing all this shit to keep them back. But by the time you get them in flower, it's like you need one per light. You didn't need four per light, you know, it's like, so that. Oh yeah, dude, time. I've been there many times. I'm so glad the LEDs dim. <laughs> or you do uh, my route this most recent time I put, I only put six in the five by five because the nine was too much and it blew it out. And then this time the six didn't stretch at all. So now I have a ton of wasted canopy space because I, I tried to flip right when I thought it was going to be enough stretch. Didn't work out. So time, you got to time and plan everything right. I'm not even kidding, dude. I hardly write anything down anymore. I do write my flower schedule on a, on a calendar so I know what day I'm on in flower. And that's it, man. I'm getting so fucking lazy at home. It's like all I do now is I just make I just keep pulling clones so my clone dome's always got some clones going in it. And then I'm always checking clones. And when they get enough root, when they're rooted, I put them in cups. And then I take them out of cups and put them into one gals. And I take them out of one gals and put them in two gals. <laughs> I take them out of two gals. And from that point, from the two gallon point, then I have to make a decision. Are these going to live or are they going to be chopped? Or am I, you know, am I going to put them into, am I getting them ready for the auto pots and put them in a fabric pot? Or am I going to put them into a planter and, and, flower them in a, in a sip container dude so, Brett, how long you been in here man you like straight up stealthed up in here the fucker came out of nowhere <laughs> go <Come> on <laughs> sneaking in sneaking in very very sneaky he's like hey what's up everybody how you doing uh i've been here for a couple minutes just kind of listening uh i like the conversation so long uh so far hearing about long plants uh man uh or long uh veg times man i've been over vegging mine but you know what? Big canopy because of it. So I don't know. It's like a big catch-22. I, I don't like vegging my plants as, as over-vegged as I have the last couple runs. You know, I know exactly what you're talking about, Spartan. Sometimes you just get busy with some other things and you just can't make that flip happen right away or, you know, whatever. Um, I'm going through that right now because I have to like change my bulbs and I have to redo some hydro lines and some things like that before I go into my next cycle. So um, we had some other projects to do around the farm and I wasn't able to get to that either right away. And lo and behold, now I'm about a week behind my normal flip time and I'm about a foot taller than I should be. So I guess what I, I fortunately have uh, HPS. I'm able to dial back my, my wattage on. So I went down to about 350 Watts from 600 Watts. And I, you know, a couple of the other plants that were really getting tall, I did a little topping on, I knew I wasn't going to go into flower for another week. So give myself another day or two and I'll get them bad boys into flower and just make sure that usually I give it like a, a good week to kind of grow. And then I start to do the shaping layer of trellising and stuff. It, the first week of bloom this time i'm just going to throw that shaping layer right on there on day one i'm going to do some bottoming and everything and just make sure that that it has something to pull it low enough to grow back up into you know but anyway guys what's going on on red setter farm you can find me on red setter at red setter farm on instagram right here on youtube frugal force uh, i don't really know what we're talking about so i'm just kind of coming in on what i was hearing you guys talk about and we hey, just kind everybody. of jumped in tonight. Like, I, we didn't even do intros at all. I, everybody but, knows who we are. Everybody it was my me. intro, I guess. <laughs> no, hey. so sorry I'm late, man. So I was just talking to one of my groomsmen. Uh, we had discussed some suit issues and things like that. Some He's getting married also, so he was kind of giving me some input on what he's doing. And and I was we started talking about some uh, music and things intercoms and stuff in the grow room i got some echo dots in the grow room and i can communicate with the house i can communicate with the the office and everything like that just with, just through the the amazon echo dot which is kind of cool so uh we were talking about playing music to the plants and things and he brought up and, and i know that we've all kind of maybe tossed around the ideas of the uh what, what are we talking about the uh deep force and uh Maybe force the, unleashed the force on force, the force. I, i'm stuttering my words guys the sour diesel's hitting me like a bag of rocks right now and i love it so anyways 
the, the like, you know, we've talked about like the different frequencies and vibrations. Maybe music would help your plants grow and things, but what about the different types of music? So we were like, so what if we played some emo music to these plants? Are they going to be real sad plants? Or what if we played some death metal? Are they going to like rock and roll and like really like, is it going to affect your effects and things? Obviously, it's all. They, Red, they actually have done studies on that and they like the classical music uh, the best. And the theory is the strings, the vibrations of the string, the string instruments. They played death metal and the, actually the plants grew away from it. Like they did terrible. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I, I think that's really interesting actually. And could it potentially filter into the effects of that plant? You know, like would smoking the, that would the be plant that you, that you played, you know, emo too, would it actually make you sad? Like, you know, man. Anyway, guys, that's but I did want to uh, bring up, a, you reminded me of, yeah, I'm going to probably, uh, this is kind of probably controversial to a lot of people. I don't know. I like controversy. But talking about tall plants and flower, early flower, I will super crop the fuck out of my plants. I don't give a fuck. I will super crop them down all the way up to till the end of week three. Like day 21 is the last day I'll super crop my plants. If it's going to so, fucking grow up after that, then... Fuck it, it can grow up after that. But uh, up to day 21, I will super crop the fuck out of my plants. And so I'm just you actually just did today. Out, you're talking pinching and bending it over, creating the mat. Yeah, I, I'll pinch. I'll, I'll, I'll find the spot on the, on the stem where I want to make the bend. And then I'll pinch from the first node above that all the way to the, the node below it, unless it's a super stacked node. So I'll pinch all that in between the two nodes, so, so it's uh, almost flops over on its own, and then it'll just it'll just flop over. I'll kind of direct it where I want it, and then I usually remove the big fan leaves off of that, off that above where I pinched, because usually one will be bent, you know, a big one will go down, and it's just I just like to take the fan leaves off the big ones. Well, you can do that even if a branch is hanging over, take all the fan leaves off, and they'll stand right back up. So. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, why you I know. Like, Say, you know, like you said, don't do it after like week three or whatever. You noticed if you do it in late flower to say, like, save a cola from a light, they, they don't really repair themselves as well at that point. Like, they'll literally, you'll have to put duct tape on there because they'll just flop over and hold themselves there. Yeah, I just, oh in my God, head, I always like think that, like, I usually count like the first four weeks of uh, flower, like transition time, like it's, it's still kind of veg. So at that time, I'm, I'm still feeding recharge because I, I want the plant to still get some nitrogen. And I know the plant's stretching still at that time. So I think, oh, yeah. to me, I can still get away with fucking vet. I mean, I've done it a lot of times and with fine results. In fact, in fact, I'll also say the, the where I've done super cropping tend to be where I yield the most on the plant. I get the biggest buds there. I can agree with that, especially the ones that heal. Like the yeah. ones that go back the knuckle, like you can't yeah. touch that butt. So I like I like hearing you say that because my my experience with super cropping has been like really variable. I've had great results, and I've also had results where the bud that I well maybe it'd be different. It was like the whole plant; it was really nice and uniform. But this was specifically one branch was just a lot taller than the rest. So I did a super crop on it, and it had like the knuckle grew. And I don't know if I was maybe within the week before or the week after flower it definitely wasn't into after flowering it was before flowering but anyways this one particular branch and there might have been one or two more throughout the canopy that i it just wasn't it, it had it had the same size and structure as the rest of them but it almost had like it had a lockout before anything else kind of did towards the end and I was, we're gonna we're gonna continue this story when we come back from this commercial break Hey Grossies, if you ever want to show your support for the show, why don't you head on over to www.mbgs.live and you can check out our swag store. There's all kinds of goodies on here, if Miss Coma Guy pillow. There's swag that's personalized for most of the panel and the ones that aren't on here should be coming soon. We have the official uh, MBGS Great Lakes Grow Off swag on here. You can get your sweaters, some new stuff on here. And of course, we can't forget about the, the custom abolished fanny pack. You know, all the cool kids are wearing it. Another way to support us, Broskies, is to head on over to Patreon and search Michigan Bros Grow Show. 
We have a few different options for you to support us there, including a show sponsor. We'd just like to thank you all for your support and love. And what can I say? We love you, Groskies. Everyone have a dank night. And we're back. We're just talking about some uh, some kale and other uh, hipster kale. stuff. No, I'm just kidding. It, it's good for you. Should eat kale. Kale, yeah. <laughs> we're over here kaling it. No, to the no, 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 no. No, we were talking about, uh, I was just mentioning a buddy of mine was um, talking about he's a vegan and I just asked what his calcium source was because I don't understand a ton about diet stuff, but I know that, you know, it's something we're trying to feed our plants. So that's what I was more interested in. He, Right away, said kale, and that kind of rang a light bulb. Oh, you meant as in dietary. I thought you meant for feeding your plants. Well, that's what I was looking at it, but I'm saying like, I mean, like a vegan source because we always look at like bone meal, and you know what I'm saying, and like some of these crab shell and oyster, all this different lime stuff. When you know we can put kale down, and it's like it's got a ton of calcium in it and other shit in it, you know, and comfrey's another one too. So I just. I don't know. It's just kind of an alternative way of thinking, I guess, from what yeah, I wonder, I wonder yeah, if you think. the chat we hear about is like, you know, all oh, you need to put gypsum down for calcium, calcium, but it's like, well, you got all, you know, you can do other stuff too, like plant-based. Yeah. That's a, actually a big, like part of regenerative gardening is like growing the plants that you want to use for your remineralization. You know, a lot of those, especially like dandelions and like burdock and um, it, plants that have real real deep roots that can get down into the actual like bedrock and like down deeper than most topsoil plants that's it boy get in there nice and deep plants like they're gonna be pulling up low ground minerals and you know like uh potassium is is a big one i think for burdock and i actually have like a handful of burdock plants that i don't try to eradicate they do drop seed and I don't really get rid of them. Like I want to have like a little burdock patch and then when it grows, I chop up the burdock and then I comp, I don't compost it. I actually just top layer it into my no-till beds and then I throw grass on top of that. And then there's my like potassium source and stuff like that. But anyway, man, I didn't mean to cut you off smiley, but that's like, I totally oh, get where you're, where you're going. No, that's that, man. kind of my thought was like all these guys talk about like growing comfrey. I mean, how hard is it to like, shit you could grow it anywhere in your backyard whatever you grow some kale and some comfrey and you fertilize your outdoor plants that way you know and if it works really well maybe move it into your indoor but i mean some of that idea they're not new ideas it's just for me personally it kind of like talking with that guy and his diet just kind of rang true because like your you know your plants diet and your plant stomach is that soil so it's like you know like what are you laying on there and how are you stimulating those microbes so I mean, there's different ways of doing it than thinking like, gyp, you know, gypsum. Or yeah, man, imagine, imagine just like <clears throat> starting beds in, in your backyard. Instead of having grass, you have beds. And in those beds, you just grew, hey, I had a bed of, of, uh, a bed of uh, kale. You harvest all that kale and dry it on screens, get it really dry, and then you could smash it all up, probably in just your bare hand if you had to, or a mortar and pestle. And now you have powdered kale that's probably good for throw it in a mason jar is probably good for God knows how long put it in your grow room and, and you could just use that as a top dress for your calcium. You know what that kale bed would be really good for also attracting aphids as like a, um, it's like a banker, uh, a banker plant. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Like broccoli, a handful of, like brassicas, man. Brassicas are just great. They, they, aphids love them, you know, toss them on the other side of your yard, you know? Huh. Then, yeah. Awesome. Especially if you got some outdoor going, yeah, get them as far away from your outdoor, then I'll suck them over there and leave them, <laughs> leave them away from your outdoor. Yeah, dude, I, I'm about to put like a big old fucking huge brassica garden on the way other. If you guys go driving down the road and you see a giant brassica garden, hit me up. Are they the same hi. type of aphids though? Because I've heard of people planting certain plants that will attract aphids, like goldenrod is the one I'm talking that I know I heard about. Yeah, I wouldn't want to really attract them to the area. That'd be bad. Type of aphid. 
and they like that because it, it won't attack the plants, but it, it attracts the same predator that eats the ones that will attack your plants. So like as far as like drawing in, you know, natural predators, they say some of them plants can be used for that because it's, it's going to draw the food source. Yeah, but it, the food source is what the predators want. And if you want the predator, you know what I mean? Like that's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, so speak. I grow. Go ahead, man. I want to do a, a shameless shout out. I saw on Instagram today, the Soil King. Shout out to Soil King. Uh, I guess if you go to SoilKing.com, I don't know how long it's going to last, but he's got free shipping on two products. I can't remember the first one, but the other one was that amazing Dr. Zimes. Um, but if you were to get aphids on a banker plant, like say kale, and you got an infestation, hit that Dr. Zimes. I mean, it's, it's an enzyme, so you, you don't, I mean, safe, very safe. And you can spray the hell out of your plants, and then now you just fucking killed all the aphids, and you still don't have to worry about them on your on your marijuana plant. <laughs> or your I cannabis. just got my free samples of Doctor Zymes because, dude, they had it was. I tried going back to the to the Instagram page again. It was like gone. It was like a like a five minute post or something. It was like free samples, blah blah. And I got a free hat pin too. Dude. It actually came. I had to pay for shipping, but so it was like a seven dollar two milliliter sample and a hat pin, but whatever, man, it was That's pretty sweet. cool. So I'm going to check it out. And I've actually been doing a little bit of research about Dr. Zymes. It seems to be like a quick knockdown. It only works while it's active. And once it evaporates, it's gone. So you want to like low heat, low light, and you don't really want probably fans directly blowing on it or anything, but I've seen a handful of like, what's the, uh, John Kohler growing your greens. It seems to be one of the things that he wants. He likes using now. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, I that Dr. Zion. shouts him out a lot but uh the way i understand is it's just basically destroy it must be a chitinase of some sort because it's a enzyme and it's uh i think they said that it acts on the chitin itself so i imagine you have to have on contact so it's like ipm not think of it ipm it's not so much like if you have it that maybe the doctor enzyme maybe that i think it would still be a hell of a knockdown i don't know i would still use it first and then maybe so I was actually going to get it for my like lettuce and stuff this year and like things that I'm growing, you know, I, in, in small baby cannabis, maybe clones, stuff that I'm putting out in the garden. And they're like just high enough to kind of be eaten by the smaller little insects or scrubbing around the ants and shit like that. That's kind of out there, but smart, uh, uh, smiley, I'm sorry to like tag onto what you were talking about drawing and predators and things. I actually grow a uh, dill specifically and uh lavender and a couple different types of salvia that will attract in uh predatory wasps uh bees it definitely brings in bees and things but predatory wasps and stuff that um that really keep the the pest issues at bay within the within the bounds of the garden there it's funny you say that because i put in we have a uh, like a herb herb patch garden thing dill is one of the ones that was in there and uh you know, sage, thyme, rosemary, things like that. And I saw so much insects out there. I saw a big mantis that was huge. He was like that big, just monster mantis, moths. I've seen all kinds of insect activity over there. So I 100% agree with what you just said because I saw it through my own eyes, you know. Thyme's a good, thyme's a good repellent, I think. I believe a repellent of mites or something like that. But. Yeah, that's what's in that mammoth biocontrol. It's a thyme. Uh, concentration or something. I like this idea though. Like you guys just go and grab, say, a four by four raised bed, and throw it out there and use it as like the Bermuda Triangle of your outdoor garden. I mean, even go as far as say like that that BB product you guys were talking about. Just go overload on that. So like anything that just comes in there just dies. Like just make it death. Yeah, then you can go in there and collect all your insect fresh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Compost Actually, it the, the enzyme thing, though, um, Dr. Zyme, I believe that's kind of like an enzyme produced by a yeast. But they, uh, can't you do the same thing with like a malted barley? Isn't that kind of like an enzyme? The soap nuts that I preach, uh, that's one of the main killing methods of it, other than the, the actual soap part, is it's an active enzyme. It'll go on there and it'll kill stuff. Because I That's know the, like, it is in malted barley, like a seed sprout tea of malted barley. I think it's a different type of enzyme, though. No. I'm not sure. I'm not that smart, I guess. Anybody home? Hey, think with fly. Think. But 
Hey, yeah, you know, I, did I ever ask you what did the one soap knot say to the other soap knot? <laughs> was sappinin? <laughs> sappinin? Oh, I like it. <laughs> 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 Yo, man, you'll never forget now. It's always happening. You always can remember. You laughing guy. <laughs> but think, uh, before our first break, sorry to interrupt you guys. You guys were going on. <laughs> I apologize. Or, sir. I just wanted to say before our first break, Red was telling us a story about he did a super crop and I didn't hear the rest of it. That it, it yeah, seems to have had crap. like um like a lockout towards the end it, it just wasn't keeping up to par with the rest of the plant you know the, that one couple branch and maybe i maybe i over pinched it maybe i broke it too much um it that's all within the realm of possibilities you know but i've also like split plants down the middle and turned it into a big broken slingshot and taped it all back together and had the whole thing kind of grow nice and didn't really experience any bad lockouts or anything so i don't know it's hard to say what's with, but I, I but think that it was like an overpinch, you know, because I do like to hear those, like what I was saying is I like the, you have success with it because maybe there's something that I just did wrong. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going to go with you. The tenderness of what you do it. I think you can be too rough with them and you can really break them because if they really snap, I think it, you kind of overdid it. There's a, there's a feel to it and it's definitely to me it's kind of like you got to experience it and the timing of it so yeah and i've know, always wow. like it's been a couple few years i mean a few years since i've been messing with the idea i've even got like a little pair of like pinchers that are really nice and flat and uh like teflon on one side and they're like a round and nice little piece of steel on the other and it, you can like really gradually like just kind of depress on it that way you're not yeah and it, it kind of just like pinches and then you can do the bend and real nice it's like a jeweler's tool there we go it's a jeweler's tool that, that I, use. I have another technique that go ahead, i don't man. see a lot of people do that it's actually you take a little you take less chance of uh doing the snap because of the hard pinch and that is uh actually taking grabbing at one point grabbing above it and twisting and you can twist until you hear a pop and when you hear that pop that branch will lean over without having to do a hard pinch so I don't like that because uh, anytime I've done that, it like seems to split lengthwise on the stem, and those it, it can happen. Hold it, that seems to, like really open up to a, like a big wound. Mm. I mean, they do form a knuckle, but it's um, okay. you always have duct tape sitting around with you when you're super cropping. Okay, so my technique is um, well, what I did to improve my technique was the whole when I was explaining to you how I pinched the stem between the nodes. I used to not do that. I used to just kind of bend it over. Well, that's when I ran into a lot of problems with it doing too much or like what Red was saying. Like sometimes it would, it would bend over and then be like this. And then just the very tip would want to curl up, but the whole branch wouldn't come up. I mean, it's a learning curve for sure. But what I did to really help myself was if you break down all that material in between where you're going to make the bend, it's more rubbery and it doesn't tend to like actually snap and break and rip and stuff like that. So I just kind of pinch, you know, just work that material so it's kind of floppy. And then you can kind of just let it fly. It's just going to flop anywhere. So, uh, yeah, and I've it, always it, had uh, really good results like in veg, right? And I would usually, I would like do that training throughout veg and stuff. Sometimes like you get that broken branch, it just won't recover. You know, it'll, it'll bottom, it'll bend up, right? But it won't, uh, you know, and it's still got a little bit of hinge on it, you know, and you're like, oh, fuck that branch. I just got to cut it off or whatever. Uh, so like throughout the veg cycle it kind of has always been really nice and worked out and you get those like knot knuckles in the middle of the branch that end up kind of looking like this you know um thinner here and uh, do you the, find when you get those when you get those knuckles and everything do you find that those buds seem to be any bigger or are they the same or less i find that they tend to be the same um i just and that was almost what my curiosity was. I had a really big knuckle on that branch that almost did that lockout too, but the, the buds were about the same size as the rest of the plant. Um, it's hard to say, man. That was like, I've never really super cropped that close to like flowering before. It's always been like throughout veg and then like the last couple weeks before veg, I kind of just leave them be. Lately, I've really been just topping. Like I go and I, I do my normal topping, but then the last two, three weeks before flower, I'm just 
top. I mean, the plants are just growing so fast. They're getting, I'm actually vegging under like 600 watt metal halides. So they're getting a lot of light. They're getting CO2. They're getting like, the rooms are actually sealed up with one of my bloom rooms. So they're getting humidity, heat. It's like 80, 85 degrees. At, even at nighttime, it's 80 degrees. So, I mean, it's just a great climate for these plants to just veg in, you know, have to really be careful about pests and things like that. But it's it, because it's just a great climate altogether. Um, so like I was saying, they over veg really fast. That's the downside to it also is that if you're not like right on top then all of a sudden, yeah, it might've topped, but even though I topped, like I'll come back a day later, two days later after I've topped and like the shoots that were down here are already up here. And it's like, I didn't even top the plants. And it was all right. So that's kind of why I've just gone back to topping, to be honest with you. And what I've learned about the people who like asking, like I've learned from the, I think Mendo Dope or something, there's something that they said was just like, anytime that there's just a top that just gets out of control and it's a little bigger than anything else, we just top it and cut it. So that's kind of one of the philosophies I've kind of just been doing is anytime just there's one or two that's just a little bit higher than the others, I top it. I don't top the whole plant. I'll top one or two and I'll come back a couple of days later and see where it's at. Sometimes you top the whole plant because it's really nice and uniform. And sometimes you just top one branch off and non monologuing guys so i'm really sorry so. i was gonna say a cool little tip to piggyback on that is say like you're somebody that's running an auto flower and you're scared to top it but you still want to end up with uh like a bowl structure i know like my og and i can go without topping that just by taking the main say the main cola of that and just keep bending that one over and i'll end up with the bowl structure that i want that i would end up with if i topped it I would say the same thing for, say, like an auto or something. If you were scared uh, to stress it, do that. Yeah. I was going to say, too, like, talking about that knuckle, like, um, in, in internodal spacing, they were saying the denser the internodal spacing is more carbon content for that plant right there. So I think when you make that, thing, that plant actually heal and form that knuckle, it's increasing that carbon content right inside that knuckle, and it should equate into being able to deliver a lot more nutrient to the fruit at the end. And that's where I think timing that correctly is really the, the big key there to whether you're going to get a improved size from it or not. That's just my thoughts on it. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, hearing Rasta Jeff on the Grow From Your Heart podcast talk about he likes to pop and twist his plants, but I, I haven't gone back and listened to his episode on it, but it sounds like the process that I told you guys that I do right before I bend it, how I'm just breaking that cellulose or whatever, I could be a hundred percent wrong, but it sounds like he does that for his whole plant from the top to bottom at a certain point right before flower. And uh, I mean, it makes sense to me from the results I've seen and from what I've been doing with my super cropping, if I can get my whole plant to, to perform like those tops when I do that, man, that might be worth it, but I don't know. On one of these times, you, I want to manufacture some time to listen to his episode to see exactly what he's doing. You'll do it one time, dude, good. and you'll never do it again because it is one of the most. It's more. It's more tedious than going in there and stripping the leaves, going over every branch and pinching down it. I've, I did it. I did it in the past. Like, yeah, you're gonna. It's gonna increase results. Your your stems are gonna get bigger, but damn, you're just sitting there for hours. Your fingers will start hurting after one or two plants. Uh, yeah it's 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 terrible man i was super cropping for a while then i went back to topping and i don't know man my canopy just got a lot more full and i don't know if i'm just over vegging or if it's from topping it, it's really hard to say i don't know if i was limiting my plants by super by pinching them all the time so well, i mean just like, respond like, better i'm hearing i'm hearing total opposite things so i mean you know this is maybe it's just maybe i'm pinching too hard man maybe i'm just a hard pincher i don't know see but i can get the same effect by just stripping them the fan leaves off that top pull so instead of cutting that that's i mean you know, strip it down to the little finger leaf that's it's, sticking out the top and those yeah, man it's awesome. it's totally just it's like the training um I, I think that there's so many ways to skin this cat of training right like yeah. we could we could like let you could grow a really really tall plant and just grow it on the ground you know like wouldn't that be cool like like it's this tall Bounce around the room <laughs> you just grow like this all the way around your room right in spiral that was my original plan with the frugal builds yeah dude right right 
Oh, they don't play playoffs. Two two years. Years. <laughs> yeah. It's been in progress two years now, but fuck, man, that'd be a hell of a bonsai project right there. Just put, <laughs> I hope I'm giving someone an idea. There you go, Avala. She got to put it in a frugal bed and just put it on like all the way to the left hand side. Grow it four foot tall and just pull that bitch all the way down to the ground and just grow those shoot those side branches up as tops. I did that on an outdoor. <laughs> it was taller than a fence, so we just yeah, you pull it right over and all the branches turn up. You know, yeah, it looked like it, it was a kick ass canopy. I can't even build a canopy as good as that one turned out. I was like stupid kid growing outdoors not trying to get caught and it was like beautiful after laying them over like i don't know this is the funniest thing i could honestly go do that right now like when i go out to the grow next with the the sour melons because they're leave there on what's today the 11th or something like that yeah they're almost a week too so they're nice and stretchy so i could just take them start lapping them over each other and see what happens yeah right now i just have them barely underneath the net if we're thinking there's no limit to like how yeah, low yeah. you can super crop, I mean, could you super crop that sucker down there by the stalk and just knock it? Yeah, down? I would. I would take them and probably uh, bond them together, you know, with the net. You know, use the net to hold them and then you know zip tie the two together, or whatever twisty tie them together. Because I've done that a bunch in the past. The sour melon itself was actually grown uh, two girls one cup style, and it was trained, you know, together to make one plant. So I know it works with it. I tell you what, if you go to the grow store, if you can find it, that Velcro tape is fucking awesome for that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. It has a big old roll. You can cut it to whatever size you want. That's the shit. I've been using it for years. You can get that at Home Depot and all kinds of places. I swear by that stuff. I found it at Meyer. <laughs> yep. But, yeah, to tie it to a net, that's perfect. You just get some Velcro tape, make a little, and boom, you're done. Disclaimer, though, it's like a dead giveaway that you're a grower because you'll randomly find little rolls of those. Just stuck to your clothes. You'll be out in public. Your girlfriend will pull them off you. It's worse than toilet paper. Mm-hmm. Is weed always stuck to your hat? Mm-hmm. You know you have that too, man. Like you're always like trying to brush yourself off. Like I, I find myself doing that all the time. Like don't make make sure you don't got no weed out. <laughs> yeah. It's like no, I was not just rolling up in my car. I literally, I just have it's just all over me all the time. <laughs> I'm so spoiled. I'm like, cause I'm working at, at work. It's around weed. At home, I'm around weed. So I'm like nose blind to myself. But I get so many looks out at public, man. It's just like, yeah, what, man? I don't know. What, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> People make comments. Oh, I love your smell. Or I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> Funky old, funky thirty-five-year-old dude. Is that what you like smell? Right. Uh, hey, I had a uh, what was it a pizza delivery lady? She she complimented me on my smell, so I had to give her a little bit. <laughs> we're allowed to do that now. It was a nice way to tip the, the pizza driver. Oh, yeah. It is a great it's, compliment when you know you smell good. <laughs> it really is, because you know what it is. You know it's your reefer, man. You're like, yeah. It's good, man. It's good. I guess I still got the loud. All right. <laughs> so uh, another another thing we had on the board was kind of, I found this super interesting. Uh, another person that talked with me about it, shout out to him, uh, Nutrient Shootouts. Uh, it was uh, the ozone, the ozonated water. And as far as you said, you guys were talking about getting up at work. I, I, I'm really fascinated on like how that's supposed to work. And if it's even... Uh, can we even get it at our, a small scale? Like, is it something that you'd want or it'd be just too much money? Yeah, I wish I had the answer to that. I haven't looked that much into it. But I do know that what I can tell you is uh, we have a unit actually coming. And so it's not like we're thinking about it. We are going to try it. But um, and to my understanding, this unit, what it does is it takes ozone, which is just three oxygen molecules, three, three, O3. <laughs> and... Uh, it's like injects it into the water. So it somehow suspends this O3 in water. And um, so the way it works as a, uh, you know, this fungicide, it's a disinfectant. So like the fungicide, bacteria, antibacterial, it's just like the, actually the plant's immune system, it uses oxidation. So uh, it'll just completely blast, <laughs> blast those uh, things just right apart. Um, 
the good thing about it is, is that like what's left over is water because it's water and oxygen. So the oxygen will eventually either, you know, be dissolved in the water and sit in the water or it'll go into the air as oxygen, you know, as a gas. So, you know, it's not like you have to worry about breathing in weird chemicals. Um, it sounds like a win, win, win. Uh, the way the, the, the way this device looks like, it's just like a little stainless steel box and it has a couple hoses coming out of it. And uh, you hook your regular, like it looked like a garden hose hookup to one side of it. And I'm, I'm sure the other side must be maybe an input for RO water or something like that. But uh, so it just runs straight through the device and you run it right off the hose on the other side. So we're just going to like do it on days when we're resetting the room. So like, for example, we just harvested today. So tomorrow we're going to go in there, clean up that room. And it'd be nice to just go in there, spray with a hose to, uh, you know, blast everything and make sure everything's clean. I mean, the walls, fans, everything, you know what I mean? And that's just going to help us on microbial is what our hope is, you know, I mean, that should help us keep under the threshold for microbials. So it's a microbial thing. It's not like, I, I, I could have misread it, but I thought he was talking something about it being IPM, but I guess that would fall for uh, like powdery mildew, but it's not going to do nothing for yeah. us. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Is it in your reservoir with your nutrients? How long does it stay suspended in the water before it evaporates or turns into water? Not super long. So I think it's just that used as a disinfectant. It's not so much used as like in your feed or anything like that. Um, I don't really know. I think it would be fine. You could probably, you could probably spray your plants with it. I don't know, honestly. I don't. I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, on the roots. I would I'm really curious about like. Well, the problem. IPM? The problem I, I would have with it is like, I think it would be great in a commercial setting. So I'll put it that way. In a home setting, I'd be worried that it's destroying all my microbiome on my leaves. And not that that's an issue per se, but you leave a blank slate and something's going to fill it. Well, shit, you could almost use that in a commercial setting to protect yourself from microbial. Well, that's, that's what I was like just that. thinking in my head was like that it would be a benefit of the commercial setting. I don't, but uh, now, Is it corrosive in any way? Like, is there I, any it's precautions you have to It's toxination for sure. So you don't want to have like a metal tipped hose that you're spraying out of that, that's going to rust. You're going to want to make sure it's one of those plastic ones. Well, it's an oxidator too, so it would oxidize terpenes and stuff too. So I guess that would be all right. Yeah, you're right. You don't want to spray your plant. Well, you can spray your veg maybe with them. But again, I, I wouldn't want to just because I, I'm worried about them. I don't know. I'm worried about leaving a blank slate for anything to just colonize. <laughs> There's also some dangers to it, right? Because if I remember right, the ozonators, you can't be in the same room as them. So what about like ozonated water? Yeah, that's. I would say that there's got to be a re-entry interval on it, which we'll have to look up before we use the device. But uh, we have a protocol when we spray anything. We got to know, you know, how long before we can re-enter it. There's these, uh, not stickers, magnets that we can stick on the door saying this has been sprayed. And that way people don't walk into a room that's been sprayed things like that so we're gonna to have to get all that figured out once we get the device and see what it's all about but uh yeah i'd imagine you don't want to breathe i mean if however long it takes for it to dissipate to water which i, I know i read that on their website i just can't remember what it is off the top of my head i want to say it was less than an hour but i'm not sure but however long that period is i wouldn't want to be in that room for that period because that means that you could probably still be exposed to maybe some ozone at that point so why take that chance? Yeah, I was just listening. A huge thing, but I was just listening to a thing on uh, powdery mildew and botrytis, and uh, they were talking about treating them with labs or LA, you know, lactic acid bacteria. Or uh, they actually broadened that and said it included other forms of bacteria, but it was like a specific cultured type bacteria. But they, I mean, it basically outcompetes and it it. It counteracts or whatever so where the spores land they're landing into like kind of like an acid almost is what I understood of it because they're like producing the opposite of what that one guy wants and it's a beneficial on the plant so like as far as like trying to kill everything in veg to me you'd want to almost control it more that way than anything else I mean it's outside of getting it tested that's a, you know they're trying to expand that testing to 
include that for commercial, but out West, I think they've done, they, they were talking about how they do different cultures to make sure that it's, you know, a, a, a human pathogen in that versus like a, you know, like he was saying, powdery mildew, I don't even think it's tested on someone because it's not a human pathogen, you know, and they're looking for E. coli and like known human pathogens. So eventually that would be cool if they would break that apart for Michigan too. Well, yeah, that's, I've been complaining about that forever. It's like, because they don't even care what it is. It seems like anything, any count, they're going to count against you. So like, like your example is like, if we had bacteria on there, that's going to, and it happened to be in the sample that they tested, that's going to count against us. Whether it's good, bad, or, or indifferent, they don't, they don't care at this point. But yeah, I think it was Oregon I was reading about. They used to have really strict regulations and then, it got to be where they couldn't even get flour in the dispensaries anymore. Whatever the issue was, they actually went and changed. They went back and made it, and they actually abolished that test completely. They don't even have a CFU test. Well, maybe they've changed now. I don't know, but last I looked, they didn't have one. Well, I don't. That's the one of the things that I'm trying to figure out is like, is there any state that has a standard for microbials that can tell the difference between beneficial and harmful? And I, I'm not finding it. Like everybody's just like, you know, you have anything on there, you have too much of it, tough shit, you can't pass. No, there, there are some that are breaking it apart. I was, it was just on uh, the Shaping Fire podcast with Shango Lewis, but he was talking to, um, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i have to look again at the guy's name, but it, he was basically making uh, the tests that they were using or, or they were figuring out all that the biology that was on the buds but they yeah i mean they were consulted to make the tests for some of these and he was the one talking about well you know if they're going to test for something we want to test for what's a human you know something that's going to be harmful to any human consumption and if and if it doesn't fall on that list then it shouldn't necessarily be tested for so that was kind of the discussion in that podcast i can send it to you to attach with this or something but. yeah definitely i mean it's it's a subject that I'm kind of passionate about and I really want us to fix it here in Michigan because like, I'm not, I'm not knocking any of the product that makes it to the shelf. It, it gets you high, it heals, but there's just something about fully grown probiotic or regeneratively grown medicine that heals you different. It feels different to me. It feels different to my patients. It feels different to all my friends and other people that I meet in the community. So I know there's got to, there's something there and I just, it's terrible that like the masses that don't have a quality caregiver don't have access to that. And they probably won't if the way things are going, because I don't, I don't know. Do they have any plans to, to fix our testing here or to upgrade it? Or are we just rolling yeah. as is? I haven't seen anything yet, but um, I think the best way to illustrate for like maybe a listener or whatever to their theory, kind of what you said now I forgot my thoughts so I can't illustrate what you just fucking said you look pretty what did you say uh I said you look shitty good night Denise uh what were you I was, I was talking about how like the stuff that is on the shelves there's not like yeah it, it, it'll you'll get stoned you get high off it it even heals some but when we're when we have like regenerative or probiotic it seems okay, to just be a little bit extra okay, I had cool. a thought dude I, forgot. I got that I got my thought back it came back Thank you for that. So the best way to illustrate that is just like with our food. You compare homegrown with store-bought, it's not even a fucking comparison on 80% of the food products out there, you know what I mean, that you can grow anyway. So it's the same way with, with the product that you – it's funny because we were just having the same conversation in a chat with uh, the Cheap Home Grow podcast. We are having the same conversation, and I was making the same point. And um, so it's the same, it's, it's for the same reasons too, I think, because the product that uh, a caregiver grows, it gets, you know, special care, it gets one-on-one -on -one care, and it uh, also goes out when it's ready. Now, the product in the commercial market, it is ready, you have to wait until it's ready, then you get it tested. It sits there waiting for test results. Once the test results are back, then you arrange a transport because we're not allowed to move it and it sits there. Then transport comes and picks it up. 
and it goes to a dispensary. And the dispensary puts it in the back room somewhere until they can get to it because they have to package it. Then they start to package it, but they only package, you know, enough to fill the shelves. Why would they package the whole, you know, 20 pounds or whatever it is they got? So then it sits there and it sits there and it sits there until it's sold. So by the time the end user gets it, if he got that first, very first package that went out, it might be a great experience, just like what you said about it. There's just some out there that's pretty good. But then there's another stuff that's maybe the first harvest that we took down last year, July, that's sitting on a shelf somewhere, <laughs> and somebody's still selling for the same damn price. And they get or it's it. been, like, remediated yeah. somehow because maybe it didn't pass, like, microbials, yeah. you know? For a hundred different reasons, but my, the point is it sat there for endless amount of time compared and degraded compared you know it's not in good environments they're not even consistent environments god knows what the trucks are like god knows what it's like in the back room of a you know provisioning center government is inefficient and should be dissolved please hold while i so well my point is is that you know you're cutting out all these middlemen by going to a caregiver when you go to a caregiver it's like going to a farmer to get your food i mean that's just one step away from doing it yourself. So I think that's the big difference and it, it shows in food and in smoke. And we're down to less than one minute. I would say it, it's medicine. We should be trying to get it at its peak, people. Stop freaking monetizing the hell out of this freaking thing. And on that note, we'll be right back. Reach out with your feelings. What do you see? The island. Life. Death and decay that feeds new life. Warm. Cold. Peace. Violence. And between it all. Balance and energy. A force. And inside you. Inside me. That same force. And this is the lesson. We have the ships. We have the weapons. We need soldiers. And we're back. We were just talking about like standards and whatnot and how like uh, some of the, like, the regenerative and the probiotically grown medicine is kind of getting screwed and in the system anyways, like people that really, really need it can't get it because the way the testing is set up. And another one that wouldn't pass testing to get out there that a lot of people preach is sun grown medicine. And really the only way I can think of it that you could do that is if you had a, a, a greenhouse set up and you had it all environmentally controlled and all that. But just straight up outdoor, outdoor wouldn't pass as far as uh, I know in any way. I think it might on rec side. Um, microbials are pretty liberal on rec side, 100,000 CFUs instead of 10,000 on the medical, medical side, which is a huge difference, but whatever. We're about to be rec anyway, so. That should make me smile. But yeah, I think I think outdoor could possibly test, but I mean, after this year, it's not gonna matter anymore unless there's gonna be a commercial company growing outdoors that I haven't heard of yet because they've already uh, squeezed the caregiver out for the by the end of this year. Well, that would be that would be my question for maybe like a micro business or something, you know, maybe, maybe outdoor sun grown or something has marketability to somebody. Yeah, I would say go, go I would say go rec market all the way and I mean I wouldn't try it on the medical side, but for sure I think you'd have a shot on the rec side. Cuz like if you wanted to do a regenerative, I mean, you could do a polytunnel or something on the ground. You wouldn't be able to do a concrete ground really. Regenerative would be difficult, I should say, if you really want to do it like if you want to try to grow into the ground. You know, I mean, my my thought is like growing into the ground. So you could build a Wall steel of frame greenhouse and you go wall of painting man get rid of the concrete you know you could always do that and that's i totally agree with all of that but then it's polygrown 
um it's not necessarily sun grown i mean i'm an indoor grower so i'm i'm like a, i'm a de grower i don't have much to talk about you know sun grown marketing or anything but my garden stuff outside like it'd be cool to be able to grow what all of your other like um let's say market it uh sustain uh that's just sustainable but like permaculture or something let's say a micro business like i'm just going off spectrum off the spectrum like let's say a micro business wanted to market their stuff like permaculture grown you know so there's just like it's in their acreage there's plants and it's within there's birds and there's all kinds of stuff and maybe somebody really wants to smoke that and buy it off of them so it, it'd be cool for the market to allow it well, somehow some way i know some people that were working on doing an outdoor as like a micro so that or i think it was actually the 500 plant they were looking at but Anyway, the plans they had was for outdoor, and then you know now they they get closer to it, and they're realizing no, that's not necessarily going to pass. So, I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I'm just going by what they're telling me. I mean, they shifted their plans based on the fact that you know all the research they did was to find out that really to pass medical, you you really can't do it outdoors. What they found. So. The biggest, I wouldn't even the biggest concern for me wouldn't even be passing testings at first would be could you keep your stuff not to get seeded from just everybody growing you know what i mean so they fly around and spray the pesticide they test for so yeah, like, exactly i mean if your county just out of the blue says oh fuck we got mosquitoes and we're gonna spray this shit all over like yeah i mean how do they hold that against the grower but the, if they do then they just basically Fucked everybody. That was a big concern of mine being downwind of like a large ag corn farm and things like that. Like yeah, yeah. if you're neighboring a corn farm and you're that pro I mean if there's, there's some pesticide. battles. Yeah. Exactly. Pesticide drift, man. I and people say, ah oh, no, you're worrying too much, or we're planting some trees or whatever, but it's like I don't know. Does it actually happen? It could. I, I mean if, if we're testing like strict pollen. enough. Like he was saying with pollen, and I mean seven miles is what guys were saying, like so you look at wherever you're growing in a seven mile radius that's a pretty big damn chunk of land to make sure you've got a fucking male plant in that circle because all it takes is one and you're like it's amazing that's uh the seven miles is a low ball because that's seven seven miles in daylight because the light degrades the pollen now I know it's a hell of a lot windier during the nighttime. <laughs> so there's all this pollen traveling all night long. And then it's got seven more hours. <laughs> Once the daylight comes out, you get a hell of a lot longer than seven miles that way. So uh, yeah, you can get pollen from everywhere. Last year I heard everybody I knew that grew outside and told me, Oh, I found a couple seeds. They found a couple of seeds. It wasn't like a huge seeded out plant, but they found like a handful of seeds or maybe more. And they couldn't really explain so what would the theory maybe be that it's pesticides have heavy metals in them, so the heavy metals fall because they're heavy, or they, they don't drift as far? I mean, I would imagine they would still, <clears throat> I mean, it's like being sprayed out in like vapor, vapors in a lot of cases, you know, as it kick up into some bit of a airstream on a windy day. I know there's precautions about windy days and things like that also. So. Well, it's even worse than that, though, Red, if, if they spray a systemic and it gets in your cloning population and you just, I mean, it's not just failing one harvest, then, I mean, that's in generation, generation, and generation. So now you fail, but you've basically got to remove that plant or that clone or that cut to really get away from it. Because, I mean, I've heard people talk about going seven generations out west in some of the discussions and they they're like still failing testing from some of them systemic things so it's basically you cut that line out and you find a different clone to run is what you wound up with i know we go down the rabbit hole sometimes on this show and now that we're talking i don't, <clears throat> I don't want to like get too deep and weary dreary right about like bad things or anything but talking about like the systemics and stuff and pesticides i've often wondered if those same systemics like when we're eating our foods and vegetables if they're still on there even in our cannabis and stuff like that if that those systemics getting into our bodies could potentially continue to remain systemic and then go into our offspring just the same yeah you know i did hear a alarming stat that they said that it was a very high number like 90 some percent of americans blood test positive for glyphosate or roundup so very well could be man everybody's got it in them 
Uh, yeah, I believe glyphosate's the cause for a ton of different issues we face at worldwide. But I mean, I don't, I'm not a doctor. I just feel it because the way people explain it. I mean, it's literally in everything, and it's it's tried to be covered up like way too much and pushed aside for me to say, "Oh, it's safe." No, it's it literally. It's it totally why. I was gonna say, it change, doesn't it change the plant's genes to where it's literally spitting out a pesticide instead of just natural terpenes to keep a uh, pest away? Like, that can't be right. You are what you eat. We know that as plant growers. Like, we feed shitty food, we get shitty plants. You need high quality inputs. It's funny you say that. I mean, learning about how the cannabis plant works and operates, like, made me actually learn about how my body operates. Like, I just thought that I ate food, got energy. I didn't understand carbohydrates and anything. Like, I knew they existed and stuff. And, I had heard that like, yeah, there's fake sugar and there's real sugar and you shouldn't eat real sugar and shit. But it was until like, I started learning how plants uptake minerals and what minerals they need to do certain things <clears throat> and how it makes like a bigger, stronger plant. And then started actually relating that to animal, human, and me and as a self, as a person, as a being of like a living thing. Like I'm not just like the creator of this plant. Like I'm organic, just like this plant. And if this plant needs to like, have the best terpenes to be desirable to f flavorful or anything like <clears throat> if I want to be uh, productive, if I want to be desirable or if I want to be flavorful, you know what I mean? Maybe I should have the right mineral composition just to say, and it actually like kind of twisted my brain to start thinking about like more into health, food health, mental health and things like that. And it did start getting me kind of going down that other rabbit hole of we are what we eat, you know? which is really important. And then that totally got me into really, really focusing on the at whatever kind of medical aspects we can pull out of this plant, you know, raw, whatever, you know, using it as a preventative before anything goes wrong, you know, trying to be proactive instead of waiting until something goes wrong to try to take a medicine or a prescription to fix it. Right. That's a good point. I, I often wonder how many you know, proactively, just like what you're saying, I, I often wonder, like, I wonder how many, like, colds I dodged or how many, you know, uh, whatever, you know, cancers that, that healed inside my body and, and how much of this stuff has happened because I'm a daily user because I, I, I use this daily to uh, de-stress my body and, uh, you know, I'm sure that has a million positive benefits because when you look at most any disease, one of the causes of that disease is stress almost on, across the board. So just the de-stress alone is healing, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, I want to, it's probably just adding life, adding years to my life. You know what I mean? They were talking about that cause it lowers your cortisol. So in stress, like your body's producing like, shit that eats you up inside basically shuts your organs down and like does crazy shit to your body and cannabis relieves that so like you can totally shift what's going on in your body because you're relaxing and not stressing out it's i don't know i think that's a lot of the medicine to it right there it's like just not stress it out yeah because that's probably you know if you look at my card and it says, what is, what have I been prescribed for? It's for pain. But every single time I go in there, the first thing I say, yeah, the best thing it's for <laughs> is just stress relief. Like if I'm having a hard day or whatever, somebody pissed me off about something, I want to hit this bomb before I make any kind of response because that always makes everything better. You know what I mean? And then you sit back and you reflect and you're like, oh, that's not that bad. You get over it. You move on instead of, Exactly what you're saying, Smiley says, just sitting there and just letting something eat you up and eat you up and eat you up and dwelling on it. It's like, boom, hit that bong, chill out. Hell, I might even, if I piss somebody off, I might even call them and say, hey, come on, what's going on? What, what are we doing? It just puts you in that kind of mood. It just levels you out, you know? Yeah. I love that, man. I, I agree. I like to talk to, to the old uh, medical doctor about um or the cannabis doctor about the other things that aren't just on the list you know i'm a i'm a pain uh primarily and <clears throat> and i'll go off and i'll talk about how it helped me 
dodge smoking my cigarette addiction of like 20 years, um, how it helped me dodge, you know, all of these different stresses uh, and how I use it <clears throat> as a, as a um, antioxidant in salads and stuff like that. I, I think those doctors definitely need all that information for them to collect the data, you know, so they can counsel some other doctors, you know, hopefully that they work with elsewhere who might hey, not be as interested. I just want to, I don't want to interrupt, but shout out to Nature's Answer. It's funny. You were talking about that before that that's where you went. And I was like, that's the same damn place I go. Awesome, man. Yeah. And, and that's cool. Yeah. See, I mean, they're totally acceptable like that. Now I've been, I've been around other doctors. You, you shy away from They're They're like drilling you with questions and stuff. And, and you're like, I don't want to talk to you about other stuff. But what I like about Nature's Answer is they do have a couple of really good doctors that they want to make sure that you're getting it for the right reasons, but they'll listen to you. And they also want to know because they want the statistics. They want to analyze this plant just as much as we do. You know, they believe in it. That's why they're, that's why they're doing it. So, you know, the, in the beginning, Oh man, they're all collecting money and everything. Yeah. They're getting paid, but they're doing a good service too. So yeah, I think some of them yeah. are really out there to do the good deed and they're out there. They're, they're not just really trying to something. push you through it there. Like they literally, they're, they give my patients that I take up there, they give them an exam. And a few of my patients, they've actually told them that they should be uh, applying with this condition after the exam compared to what they wrote on the paper. And that's what ended up getting improved. Like these guys do do good work up there. Totally. I love that. The, why do doctors freak out about that? Cause like I, I got a buddy that's had a bunch of back surgeries and stuff and you know, he's years on opiates and then like he's been off it, but, trying to get off it like trying to mix it if he ever got caught like they'd like pee test him or whatever and like and basically at the end it was like they found thc in his pee and like cut him off from all of his meds so i, I just didn't understand why they were like why do they make a patient try to you know dude, why can't they blend I that have... somehow to get off it why has it got to be like off the fucking cliff for the dude and you're on a bunch of rso or whatever to try I to tell you why i can tell you why it's because so for one it's the insurance companies the insurance companies require the test so that they can get out of paying for everything so that's what that's about now why do the doctors freak out about it because they can you know they can lose their uh, status if they recommend something that hasn't been you know okayed from the you know medical associations where they're all federal associations so they're not going to say any they're not going to touch cannabis because it's still illegal so doctors don't want to even talk about it there's doctors out there that will and there's doctors out there that will fill out your papers and god bless everyone that does you know and, i can, and I think I can go on and play just a, you know i can just go on and play copay instead of having to pay a higher amount that would yeah. be a blessing i don't i don't have that but so I go to Nature's Answer, and I think they're I think they're all a godsend. You know, people can say, "Oh, they're out there; they're only doing it to make money." Blah blah. I don't care; it's worth every fucking dime. You hope they Absolutely, make money dude. so that they stay around the next time you need them. And exactly. I think some of the doctors in the beginning were kind of cautious because if you do end up getting caught without, uh, um, I don't know, over your limits and all this other, stuff, you know, you you'd end up catching a court case or something. And I'm, I, I believe that the doctors may be summoned into those court cases just to verify that your uh, your reasonings and everything. Don't don't quote me on that. No, you, I verify they can. They, Nature's Answers. Okay, well that's yeah. Doctors have testified in court for my sister. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so I think that that yet another reason, something. yet another reason for me to love those guys out there. So awesome, man. Yeah, cheers. Up. Big ups to those guys. It's, over it's there. another thing that needs to be changed because we're not at least I'm not preaching that cannabis is the cure all. It's, but it is an amazing combination with these medicines out there. Because I have patients that uh, get say like they have to have a painkiller for something. They only they would be prescribed say they'd have to take two of the painkillers. If they have cannabis or say just a simple joint or a bowl to hit, they only had to take a half a painkiller for that regimen. And then there's people that like, I'd say like even I have a family member right now that's bedridden in a hospital from uh, like inflammation issues and being overweight and he keeps on getting MRSA, which is the bacteria in the hospital that is like is it resistant to everything. But they have studies recently that CBG has been able to uh, break down the outside barrier of uh, MRSA. And that's one of the first things to do that. 
but it's just one more thing where like I'm not I I can't help him out and he can't he can't take he can't go and reach out to get it himself because they'll take away his pain meds and then he'll be crippled from the pain but he would be able to have a normal life if I feel anyways if he was able to supplement cannabis in there instead of having to sit there on painkillers and then antibiotics to fight this MRSA like he had he's not getting any kind of like uh, a boost to his system or re-inoculation yeah so so off that I want to like and kind of on the opposite side of what good we're talking about with some of these doctors there's some I've actually had some experience so I, I don't want people to get discouraged if you get denied for whatever reason if your doctor is a stickler or something you know go go somewhere else check out maybe another time frame, maybe talk to the, uh, some, uh, someone else, maybe even see another doctor or go to another establishment. But I have had, like, there are some doctors I don't think are fit for the cannabis community, period. Um, I've actually seen doctors have taken patients to doctors who have patients who have actually been into the hospital for pain issues and actually been under morphine and like six other pain, like IV drip style, um, you know, for like these uh, intestinal pains and things like that, uh, stress related and stuff and like been put on like morphine and other, uh, I don't even want to start quoting a bunch of them, but anyways, totally out of it for like days, you know, um, but anyways, paperwork, everything in hand, go to the cannabis doctor and the doctor's like, no, and actually on the folders, like, writing all over it writes that that the patient's too young because the patient was only 19 which by the way is totally legal in michigan um and this was you know many years ago so we went to another doctor and got everything figured out and fixed and it was actually the same establishment we threw a fit and saw another doctor at the same establishment and uh, got treated really well so but but that doctor i don't believe should be fit for the cannabis community to be honest with you because they're denying somebody who's being Given op opioids, there were opioids involved, um, as you know, obviously the um, uh, morphine, you know, and things. Uh, so it's it's a strange, strange catch twenty two that that you can find yourself. It's like, well, you really want to like battle this opioid crisis, but you're not allowing people with legitimate reasons to do this. So yeah, there are a couple of doctors, but I don't want to like turn anybody off from trying to get their med card. Just go oh. see somebody else because that is like a, a Point zero one percent, you know, but it does exist. What you're on this high thought here, like we can't appeal to their heart. We can't appeal to their heart. Let's appeal to their pocketbook. I'm sure. I mean, one of our data nerds is probably going to destroy me on this one, but I think that say, like within my own studies, that patients, like you said, painkillers and specific, specifically antidepressants, they have to take as low as one fourth of the recommended dosage if they have cannabis to go along with it because it helps deliver that medicine to all the needed parts a lot efficient a lot more efficiently wouldn't that uh lower the cost of health care all across the board if we brought that in yeah but then plenty the doctor, of cannabis the doctors get bonus by how many prescriptions go out not by how few prescriptions go out you know there, there's some models in yeah. europe that actually bonus the uh doctors by how healthy their patients are. Wow, what a crazy idea. Why would they do that? Well, they don't do that here in capitalist America. Yeah, in Eastern medicine, man, they, they seem to have something down there. I would tip the hell out of my doctor if I never got sick. I'm just saying. A lot more. You, probably, is, you probably have a better life than what the insurance companies are giving you. You feel a lot better about it. Or not insurance, but uh, pill companies or whatever. I tip them some Pharmacies. good weed, man. I tip them some really good weed. <laughs> right. Yeah, man, I trust Mother Nature for the medicine. Totally. At least for now, you know. And and like you said, man, like you said, even if you have to like actually use pharmaceutical grade medications because that's what you're, you really need, uh the cannabis can help deliver it at a fraction of what you, you know, the statistics may say that your body needs. That's kind of cool. It's incredible as a matter. I do want to rewind just a little bit and I just wanted to highlight what red said though. I mean, it was a perfect example of what to do in that situation though. If you, you go to your regular doctor, you bring up cannabis and they're not a big fan or they're not going to help you by writing out the, the recommendation for you. Do what abolish was saying, hit them in the pocketbook, say, okay, well, guess what? 
I'll just take my business elsewhere. If, if that's how you feel, I mean, there's plenty of evidence to say that what you're saying is completely wrong. And if you're willing to ignore that, what else are you willing to ignore? And walk the hell out and then and go to the next one. And if you have to do that 10 times, you're going to, the 11th time is going to be the one where that's going to see your point of view or maybe ask questions with you and not, you know, have some closed minded attitude toward it. So, I mean, just keep trying. You know, that's how everybody succeeds in life. It's not that they, you know, people didn't fail. It's that they didn't, didn't stop trying. So just keep trying. Eventually you're going to hit somebody. Dude, the cannabis conversation is coming up everywhere. We were out in a little dinky dinky. It, it was a small town population of like 12. We were in like this, the smallest like local, like little VFW W type joint, you know, that there could be. And it, it was like, uh, there's like four or five people in there, you know, and the ca- cannabis conversations come or you know, at least the caregiver conversations coming up and stuff. And it's like, people are talking about cannabis, the normalization is coming around, you know, I, I think that there's a disconnect with the, with the doctors and obviously it's coming through s- federal scheduling and things and the doctors, you know, they, they kind of have, they, they can't really recommend anything that they're not really taught. I don't think legally, um, don't quote me on that, but I think that that's kind of where a lot of them are afraid is that if they do recommend something and then you get sick or something that can, they could lose their license or something. I'd imagine. Yeah. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. yeah. Me neither, but it's, God forbid, that I, I, yeah, God forbid they make a decision to educate themselves on something to better their patients and the hell with the ramifications. I mean, well, that's think, what I say, man, God bless those ones that are actually out there that are helping. Yeah. Patients. Yeah. yeah. That's what Pretty I mean. Sure once they have their degree, their they their research beyond that point is up to them. Like if they want to recommend new stuff, they need it to, to research it before they'll do it. And I, I don't. I just, I think there's more bullshit on the table for them than them actually saying no. I don't want to do it. I think it's more of a a money thing down the road where they're gonna get they're gonna lose out why they don't do it. Yeah, I think it's all tied to the little bonuses from the pharmaceuticals. I mean, it just makes sense. So, yeah, uh, what more topic we wanted to get into, because, I mean, it's all over the news and stuff is, I mean, it tied into, ties into a little bit is like uh, caregiver responsibility and just, you know, being a good, a good caregiver, I guess you'd say is like, Right now, with like flu season and like the corona stuff like that going around, like you as a caregiver are responsible to take care of the health of some seriously sick people and possibly people with autoimmune diseases and stuff that are really susceptible to it. And uh, you should be taking extra precaution right now. I feel like you, I mean, it sucks. Don't go to events right now. You know, don't smoke after people, just your your caregiver. You grow your own stuff. People will understand for two months if you don't share your joint, your blunt, your bowl or whatever. It's just, I mean, it, even if it's not as serious as it, everybody's making it out to be, it just, I mean, be safe right now, guys. I mean, be smart. Don't be stupid. Don't be hysteric. Just be smart. There's a couple little tricks I'd like to shout out, like, Tommy Chong and a handful of like, oh, maybe like Duchess and like some good hash smokers and things like that. It seems a couple of these tricks where you can like take your piece or you take your, uh, usually it's like a chillum or something, but you can take your joint. Let's say, let's pretend this was an awesome joint. I'm smoking out of a bowl, but kind of put it in your hand and make yourself a little, a little bowl like that. And so you can take your buddy's joint, pop it in there, and give yourself a nice toke on it and pass it along without actually, you know, putting your mouth on it you know a couple little tips if if you do want to exchange that but i totally agree with abolish man let's be safe out there and we're cannabis smokers let's do the responsible thing about it and not spread ourselves around or if, you, blue. or if you go to like a michigan bros grow show event you could bring out your special epic one-of-a-kind michigan bros grow show steamroller you <laughs> just pop your joint in there and you'll be okay Eagle's anti-corona device. He should have made it out of a corona bottle. Yeah, he needs to do some <laughs> corona bottles. What he's yeah. Do. Oh, yeah. 
just put a big uh, a circle with an X through it for the uh, anti-corona. That'd be perfect. Everybody has their own. All over Instagram now. That everybody has their own. You just pass the joint. <laughs> I like a nice, uh, like joint tip or something. I I I got a couple glass ones, but they're a little thinner, so I put them on the inside and I use them more like a tip, you know. But I'd like to get a nice real. I've all, I've often looked. I want to get like a nice. I don't know, like uh, marble or like bone or something, maybe like carved bone or, you know, like a real nice. Like antler. You need some antler. 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 There you go. Perfect. Real nice, cool design. Maybe a serpent or something on there. Yeah, dude. I love it. Speaking on that, I kind of want to pick you guys' brains on those tips or because uh, I showed you a while ago, I had those uh, hollow tips from the, uh, the Grand Champagnes. And I want to turn those into different tips like that. Now, do you just put them in there straight like that, or is there like a certain hardener you you would soak it in, or I just put it straight in like that, cut it to size, throw it in there, try it out. It'd be just like straw. I think straw. Brett, you were talking about them before, weren't you? Yeah, man. I used to make them out of my granddaddy all the time. What I would do is I would drive a smaller stem through it and kind of like get a lot of the. Um, hull what was that stuff on the inside like the cotton material whatever that stuff is you know ah, the pith and all that stuff pith yeah thank you thank you um so it, you know sometimes depending on the size and then i'll run like another smaller stem through it but yeah man uh the, it can be brittle you got a couple funny techniques you can do a scissors like rolling it and creating like uh a, a, a cut line you can kind of like snap it and try not to crack it horizontally if you want to Crack it vertically, but yeah, man, um, great tips. Plus, about a half inch long. You all whatever size you want, man. It all matters how big the plant is. But like you said, man, what what strain was it that works for you? It was the Grand Champagne from uh, Grand Champagne. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. For me, it used to be Granddaddy, and lately I haven't been getting any hollow tips out of it, so I'm a little bit disappointed because I wanted to get back to it. Well, yeah, I don't see it very often. That was just because I had that femur in there that I, I had them. Yeah, I'm curious to what it was. It had to have been environmental for me. I'm not sure. I, it seems to be just 2020's genetics or holts. They they just beast off. Dude, I've used them as straws. Pop them in your drink. Mm -hmm. They just grow so fast. They just grow so fucking fast. Right? It's like they, they, take, they pick the most vigorous plants to breed with. I've been smoking on that, that winning Fino of snow cane this whole time. I'm fucking wrecked. But I also ate that cookie, and that's hidden pretty well right now, too. So I should probably stop smoking. <laughs> Sometimes you smoke just because you like the flavor, though, too. Like, there's certain strains where you're just like, you know, you're baked already, but it tastes so fucking good. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's my sour melon, man. I, it'll be like one, two in the morning, and I, I'm still smoking it because I can't put it down. But I'm all hyped up because I'm sitting here smoking a freaking, you know, sativa. I, I seem to hit a plateau. I'll hit a plateau after like my first, second, or third toke. <laughs> first, second, or third toke, I guess, depending on. Usually it's like my third or fourth toke through the joint through whatever half joint or something and i'll hit like my plateau and from there it doesn't matter like how much i smoke throughout the day i can't really elevate above it <clears throat> have you, but have you tried that with edibles <clears throat> eat an edible no. <laughs> that's what i'm doing right now dude it fucking is great man mm -hmm. you eat that edible it just pushes you past that and then you keep smoking and i'm going to continue to smoke even though i shouldn't but dude, all is good ass how do you keep smoking it's like i'm just not getting high <laughs> But yeah, that happens to me a lot. If I just straight smoke, it's just, it's just nothing. And I was a cigarette smoker, and it does help alleviate some urges and things, which I do. Are you addicted to this? Yes, I'm totally, I'm addicted to the habit of smoking. Yeah, but I think that this cannabis smoke is a lot better for me than whatever, I don't know. I'm not going to label whatever company I was. There's drones out there now. <laughs> Abolish, do you still have a cut of snow cane or you don't? No, I've basically lost everything. Everybody's cuts. I think I'm down to, uh, I have, what is it, sequences, crescendo now and flower, and then that'll be the last of, like, my friend cuts from that whole session there. It sucks. 
I was just, I was going to say that one's a sativa too. I wanted to warn you. <laughs> yeah, I really like the, I liked your sample, and I liked the little bit that I got out of it myself too. I'm real curious to see if that was the uh, the gusher that made uh, the squish, because it was, it was just covered in tripes. I mean, from oh, tip yeah. to tip, and they were thick ones. Yeah, that's a really, really frosty, frosty, frosty one. So. I'm keeping it in the garden, so it's one of the top three. I got to run through a lot of fucking genetics still. So many genetics. But that crescendo, I've got that in flower right now. I'm really liking the smell of that one, man. It's really, it smells really nice. It kind of grows like GG4. Is there a GG4 in that? I don't know. It kind of grows a little bit like GG4. Speaking of that that room right there, I guess I can talk on that one for a minute. Uh, now that I've not, I've, my grows at a different facility now I have to travel to so I'm not updating as much but that room had quite a few mess ups in it and I've been able to recover and I want to do like a, a short or something on it on like how to recover a room and if you should recover a room but anyways this room first it was flipped in the flower too early so I put it back into 24 hours because uh, I was messing with DLI and I ended up taking the light or the dark time down to 10 hours. And I had two or three strains that went heavily into flower at those two or three hours or at that 10 hours, way before the 12 hour mark. So then I had to recover from that. And then by the time it started to recover from that, I was at my uh, flipping point because I, I make sure I flip a room on the first of every month, no matter what to keep all the patient meds. And uh, so I flipped it. And then I realized 30 days into the grow that I was giving it 13 hours of light instead of 13 hours of darkness. So it grew for the last, like whatever, 30 days on the 13 hour of light. But I mean, it's still, it's they're frosty. They're really, really thick, but they're literally only two foot plants. So I'm going to get some great personal smoke out of it, but I mean, I don't know how much the, I'll have for patients. Did you, did you correct it or did you leave it? Yeah. Oh, it's no. corrected now. What if you dropped it down to 11 hours of daylight? You gave it 13 hours of nighttime. That, yeah, that's what it's on now. That's the, that's the cycle I normally try to do, but for some reason I had a high on moment and had the two flips. How long? Which I've done in the past with manual timers too. How long ago did you did you make that correction? I'd say probably a week ago or so. Did you notice that the buds started stretching at all after that? Uh, no. They they everything's been staying pretty, fairly squat. There's lots of one leafers and three leafers in there though from all the stress. So DLI is kind of something that I've been kind of working on, I guess, but. My understanding of that, like if you go from 18 hours of light down to 12 hours of light, you actually, to maintain the same daily light integral, you would have to increase your your amount of wattage over that 12 hours too. But I just wonder how much that, that affects. So like in my case, I, I'll go from 2000 watts in the last stage in veg under and then go under 4,000 watts, and I'm still kind of like running into a negative effect into this into a plant. And I just had a ballast go out, so I added an LED light, and uh, and I noticed that under that LED light, switching from a metal halide to that LED light, the plant seems to be loving it way better than going from the LED under a metal or a HPS. So it gets like a lot more wattage and it's like a different, um, a way different spectrum than what it's been getting. And I'm just wondering how much of that's actually fucking my, my plan a little. So like, I was trying to get a my head around that to where maybe I can adjust my lighting schedule. So if I'm at 12 hours and it's overpowering them, say I can drop it to 11 hours. It's a real mild adjustment, but as far as like that daily light integral calculation, it'll it'll adjust that number maybe to something the plant handles a little better and I won't freak them the fuck out as much, but I don't know. <laughs> well, we're getting down to our one minute warning here. So, uh, 
want to go ahead and do some shots because it is getting kind of late. Yeah. So, uh, Red Setter Farms, want to go ahead? Yeah, you guys can find me on Instagram right here on YouTube and on Sunday nights in the Michigan Bros Grow Show. Check me out, guys. Uh, anywhere you want. And don't forget, holler at me if you have any questions. Cheers, everybody. Shout out to all you guys on the Frugal Forest. Love you guys. Smiley. Hey, I'm Smiley's Garden. I'm just on Instagram and join on here. Um, I give a shout out to uh, Country Roots. Um, go check them out. They carry a lot of the stuff that we need as organic farmers and they're great people. So Hope to have them on here soon. Uh, Spark Girl. The mute button got you. Oh, got me. I'm Spartan Grown. You can find me on Instagram at Spartan Grown, or you can find me at work at Minton Gardens, also on Instagram. Uh, shout out to the guys at Minton Gardens. We worked our ass. Oh. I hate goodbyes. <laughs> Oh, she's here.